James 3, 13 through 18. Let's listen to God's word, and then I'm going to pray for us. Verse 13 of James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Would you please let it start? Let it sink deep in us so that we might be changed from the inside out, that we might grow, that we might love you more, that we might love one another more. And I pray, God, that as we tackle faith, as we tackle wisdom, as we talk about these things, that that really we would be changed, that we would think differently when we leave this place today, that we would be different when we leave this place today. Would you, by your Spirit, Empower the words that are spoken this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, faith and wisdom. We are in a series on faith. We've been talking about faith for quite a few weeks now. Uh, understanding these truths that, that we live a life here on earth. We have breath. We've been given life. And we, we live life with the existence of faith as a major part of that life. And we've been talking about how faith intersects life and how we are to process the world around us and process things that are happening through the lens of faith. As Christians, we're told that we live this life by faith. That life is more than what we just see in front of us. And I don't think you just have to be a Christian to understand or at least appreciate this truth, right? I mean, we, every human being on this earth, whether you believe in God or not, you have to live life reconciling some things about faith because we, we all take risks. We all believe certain things are going to happen and, and not happen in order to make life functional here. Right? I mean, the simplest example would be like we, we go, when we're driving our cars, we get to a traffic light, and if it says red, we stop. If it says green, we go. If it says yellow, we go really fast. <laughs> that, that, that's true. No, but seriously, right? Because there's an element where when the light is red and the other lights are green, when you're going green and you're, you're trusting that the people at the red are going to stop so that they don't barrel into you. And we could go through, I mean, all of life, that we we are believing things are happening and not happening. And so I don't think you have to just be a Christian to have an appreciation of this. But as Christians, we have a greater understanding that God is orchestrating life in a very unique way and that our life is more than just the two steps, the few steps, the few feet that we see in front of us. Faith intersects life at every turn. So the question that I want to help answer today, the question that I think is crucial for us is, how do we best apply faith to our everyday lives? How do we best apply faith? Because we could... We could have all the faith in the world, and if we don't use it in a certain way, if we don't apply it in a certain way, it will not be as effective as it can be, or it'll just be straight up dangerous. It'll be wrong. There, is, there are good ways to apply faith, and there are bad ways to apply faith. So that's the hope today, that we can kind of expand this idea, right? I mean, our, our lives are complicated, right? Our, our lives, uh, to, to, to say that we live life by faith and, inter- and interact with faith on a daily basis um, can get complicated, right? Living by faith forces us to interact with people. Living by faith forces us to interact with ideas, 
It, it, it forces us to interact with technology, with so many different things that are happening in and around us that we are constantly confronted with, with good, good ideas and bad ideas, good people, bad people, helpful, unhelpful. I mean, just the idea of having a conversation with someone means so many different things, right? I mean, to, talk, to have a conversation with a person 50, 60 years ago meant something very simple. You would be in front of someone else. You would have eye contact. You would converse. You would exchange words, ideas, all these things. A conversation now is very different, and it's not good or bad. It's just different. It's more expansive, right? A conversation could be the old school way of doing it where you actually talk to somebody, or it could be um, via phone. It could be via text. You could have a text conversation. You could be having a conversation over all the various different platforms of social media. There is a constantly evolving sense of what it means to interact with one another and with ideas and with technology. And so we have a challenge ahead of us, in front of us, to say, like, how does faith appropriately intersect with how we live? How does faith appropriately intersect with how we live with other people, with these technologies, with these ideas? And, and I just want to say that this is such an important question because faith, faith is not just about you or it's not just about me or it's not just about me and my relationship with God or you and your relationship with God. It's about you and you together. It's about you and you and you Together, it's about us together. Faith, living this life by faith is inherently communal. Like there is just, look, you're stuck with it, man. Like you just look around. There's people all around you. We, you can't pull back and isolate and live life the way that God intends for you to live life. Because ultimately this life isn't just about us together, but it's about God and what God wants for us and wants us, how he wants us to live. We live life together, whether we like it or not. And so that's where today's topic comes in. We're going to talk about wisdom and the intersection of wisdom and faith. So I want to ask you to just think quickly. You have four seconds to come up with some definition of wisdom. Okay, what do you think wisdom is? Don't yell out. You just, you just think about it. You can write it down. You can jot it down on one of your little devices or on your notepad if you do that. Um, What is wisdom? Because we can talk about it all we want, but if we don't have a good understanding, and we're going to flesh it out more today from Scripture, but it's helpful to have a concise definition of things that are so important to us. So what is wisdom to you? All right, you got it? I know I didn't give you much time, but you can still, I'm going to tell you what it is anyway. So in the past, I have, um, I've kind of, simplified the idea of wisdom, the definition of wisdom, down to what I would call skillful living, right? We take knowledge that we've been given and we apply it skillfully to the life around us. As it talks, as it relates to this idea of faith and how faith and wisdom, I would define wisdom like this, okay? God-honoring applied faith. Okay, and I know what you're thinking. Like, Adam, this is the worst grouping of four words I've ever seen in my life. Like, this is not, this is not a, this is a clunky statement. Like, how did you ever graduate college or seminary and put these four words together? But let me tell you why, okay? Let me tell you why I think this is important. Because if I were to just take away these two words and just say applied faith, which is really what I'm getting at. It is applied faith. It's taking my faith and applying it to life. Um, I already talked about that there are not so, there's some great, not so great ways to do that, where you can take your faith and apply it in a totally inappropriate way that would not honor the Lord. It would be just about what you want and how you want to live rather than how God wants you to live. So I have to put this here, and it's not just a tagline like, oh, yeah, God honoring. No, no, this is like essential. We want to honor the Lord with our lives. We want to glorify him with everything that we do. And so when we take our faith and we properly apply it to life, we want it to be done in a God-honoring way. And so I try to just boil it down to something, you know, simple for us. And even though it's clunky, I think this is really helpful. Right? I could have all the faith in the world that God loves me, is going to protect me, and then I'm going to go skydiving and I'm going to say, well, who needs parachutes? I have faith. 
That's not a God-honoring applied faith, okay? That is a, going to be a messy applied faith. Wisdom is about learning how to make decisions. It's learning how to process information, and not just in ways that makes me happy, but in ways that honors the Lord. When threats come at us, what's the human response, right? There's two things, right? We typically, we classify threat response in two ways. We fight or flight. We fight or we flight. We fight or we fly, right? So what happens when we want to fight, right? Threat comes at us and we're like, okay, danger, 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 threat, I'm going to fight. It's aggression. It might be anger. It's I'm going to deal with this hands on, maybe mouth, you know, like I'm going to be yelling. I'm going to take it on head on, right? And that's, that's one way of handling things. The other side is the flight response, right? So danger, danger is coming at me and all of a sudden, okay, I, I, I want to withdraw. I want to isolate. Anxiety comes in and I'm trying to process how to get out as soon as possible. And so, you know, these are the two kind of main responses, but wisdom helps us, right? Wisdom comes in and says, maybe it's not just these two categories. Maybe there's a way to process this information. Wisdom comes in and helps us settle down. It helps us to evaluate. And to say this, guys, that we are dealing with threats all the time, and I'm not just talking about these catastrophic type of threats that come in to, you know, where there's a robber or someone is endangering our physical body, but listen, we perceive threats all over. When someone comes at us with an idea that's contrary to what we believe, some of us get into fight mode. Come on. Yeah, you think, what would you say? Or flight mode, it's like, oh, yeah, you're right, I don't, I can't, I don't want to deal with this, I don't want to, I don't want you. Wisdom can help us handle this stuff in a way that honors the Lord. And so we need to know what it is, and we need to know what it isn't. And it was really interesting, I came across this great article um, when I was just studying this and thinking through it, and the article uh, was uh, entitled, um, Wisdom Isn't What You Think It Is. And it doesn't always come with age. Not the most creative title, but that was the title of the article. Wisdom isn't what you think it is, and it doesn't always come with age. And so the article was about this, it was kind of outlining the ideas of this wisdom expert. It was this woman, this is all, you know, secular, it's not Christian, but it was very interesting. Her name is Ursula Staudinger, and she has been a researcher and psychologist forever, right, for just years and years and years and years. And she's now is a professor at Columbia University, and she is an expert in humanness and understanding, you know, wisdom as it relates to people. And so what this article did was it kind of outlined 10 of her thoughts on wisdom. And I don't want to go through all of them, but there were a few that stood out that I thought were just helpful, even just to get an interesting perspective on what people outside the church think about wisdom, because wisdom is such a valuable virtue for us as Christians in the church. So one of the things I thought was really interesting was she said um, one of the points that was pulled out about her teachings is that wisdom isn't taught in schools. I thought, wow, that's pretty fascinating, Uh, especially at the younger ages, right? It's all about knowledge transmission, not so much about wisdom transmission on how to apply that knowledge, but it's just rote memory and, you know, you're just learning how to do these things. And I thought, wow, man, that's really helpful for, for us to think about, for parents, that, okay, we, we need to be thinking about not just sending our kids to school and they're going to pick up on these things. We have to really invest in, in the younger generation. Another thing she said uh, was that wisdom may come with age, but there's no guarantee. Wisdom may come with age, but there's no guarantee. Look, just because you get older and more experienced in life does not mean that you are necessarily wiser. We don't just drift into wisdom. And we chuckle, but to my older friends, and as I'm entering more into that category, um, we, th- we, tend to, we tend to think that, and we, sometimes as we get older, we, just, we get proud, and they're like, yeah, I've been there. I'm, I've forgotten more than you'll ever know, and you know, just listen to me and... Look, there's, that is not the case, and I think we'll see that more as we, as we unfold the text here. 
Uh, another thing she said was wisdom requires thinking outside the box. I thought that was really helpful too. You think about, um, I was thinking about Solomon and he's, you know, one of the wisest men that ever lives in scripture. And there's that story of the two mothers that come to King Solomon and they say, uh, one mother says, this is my baby. Another mother says, no, that's my baby. And they're both arguing over this baby. And so what does Solomon do? He says, all right, this is an outside the box thinker. Uh, we're going to cut the baby in half. You get half, you get half settled and he obviously wasn't really meaning for that to happen, but the one mom was like, yep, sounds right, let's do it. That's fair. The other mom says, of course, no, 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 no. Please, she can have the baby. And who was the mom? The mom that loved the child, didn't want it to be cut in half. It's wisdom. It's applying outside-the-box thinking knowledge. Then there was this one, and this is where we're going to hang on for a while. Some things that seem like wisdom actually aren't. Some things that seem like wisdom actually aren't. I thought, man, wow, this is good because, I mean, this is, this brings us to James, right? This brings us to our passage today because he is basically saying the same thing. He opens up his whole section of, uh, of scripture here. In verse 13, he says what? He says, who is wise and understanding among you. He throws this line in the sand type of statement out there, this gauntlet to say, I'm going to ask a question. Who is wise and who is understanding among you? And I think this is so important because we, we need this. He's saying to his readers, a lot of you are reading this, you're reading my letter, and you, you think you're wise. You think you're doing things that are God-honoring, applied faith. But you're not. You're missing it. And, and we need to understand what the right way of applied faith is and the wrong way. We need some things that seem like wisdom aren't to you. And there is a false wisdom, and there is a true wisdom so let's talk about wisdom of what it is and what it isn't. I mean, that's what James is saying. And really, his whole book, his whole letter is about wisdom. I mean, this is a wisdom letter. It, from chapter 1 all the way through the end of James, is about wisdom. And I, I just, to highlight a few things through here, if you, I'm not going to read specific scriptures, but, you know, chapter 1, to let you know, is all about um, asking for wisdom when we're going through trials, that bad times are going to come, that hard things are going to happen in life. And so when those things happen, he says, count it all joy when those things happen because it's doing something in your life. And he says, you need to go to God and ask for wisdom. And don't just go, but ask in faith. Ask with boldness that God is going to, to meet you in that, and he will because he answers prayers like that. And he, he, he talks about the difference between hearing God's word and knowing God's uh, word and doing God's word, that we don't just hear God's word, but we also need to do God's word. And then chapter 2 talks about the sin of showing partiality, right, the sh of showing partiality to people based on superficial things. For him, he talks about whether how much money they have or what position in life they have, and we could add on to that. We don't show partiality based on color or creed, or we don't show partiality based on superficial things about how someone is dressed or the way they you fill in the blank. And he brings in Jesus' command, and he says, uh, with the way Jesus said, to love your neighbor as yourself, and that we're not just to say that we have faith, but we are to show our faith. And the very famous statement, faith without works is what? Dead. Dead faith is a faith without works. And then chapter 3, leading up to our passage, he, he goes into this whole argument about taming the tongue, how we're supposed to be careful how we speak, and that not many people should be teachers because teachers are going to have a stricter judgment because the words that we speak are influencing others and words are powerful. And he talks through how the tongue is trouble for us. And starting in verse 6 in chapter 3, you can just hear some of the language. He says, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Um, he says, it's set on fire by hell, uh, that every kind of beast can be tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. And he says, you can tell a lot about a person by the way they speak and how they speak. And then he comes to verse 13, he says, who is wise and understanding among you? And he's, he's 
painting a picture, saying, look, all these things I've talked about, and I'm going to continue to talk about them, but look, let me stop and, make a, and ask you a question. Who is wise? Because I see these things are being lived out in your lives, and yet you continue to say that you're wise, but there's something missing. There's a gap. And so he says, I'm going to tell you how to spot wisdom. I'm going to tell you how to spot wisdom. And let me tell you this, church, and for you and me, this is just so crucial. This is so important for us because we need this. We need to be able to spot wisdom. We need to be able to exercise wisdom. We need to be able to spot it when others are doing it, but also in our own lives. When we are making decisions, when we are speaking and doing and living and acting And I'm telling you, we need it more, maybe more now than ever, because the church is in a position in a in a world that is just polarizing. We have to have a voice that will engage and encounter the culture, and we we better be wise. Because if we're not, who will? We will, we will lose our voice. We will miss opportunities to share the gospel because we are, well, we're going to engage in what false wisdom and true wisdom is, and we'll see how if certain characteristics are displayed versus others, it will produce the wrong things. So really quickly, we're going to look through these. James gives us a, a nice list of false wisdom and true wisdom. Okay, so false wisdom, we're just going to look at like seven of them. I'm just going to put it up there for you. And I want you to think about, as I'm going through this, I want you to think about the common theme that flows through each of these characteristics. This is false wisdom. It seems like wisdom from a person, but these things start to show themselves and it proves that they are false. It's fool's gold. First thing, bitter jealousy. Bitter jealousy. We could translate this best as harsh Zeal, it's where we get the word zealot. Someone who is bitterly jealous is it's the first characteristic given to us of someone who displays false wisdom. It could be also seen as rivalry. This is the person who sees himself as jealous for the truth, but in reality, it's all just about what's going on in his own heart. It's really bitterness coming out, right? You know the face you make when you take a bite of a lemon, right? Something very bitter and you just... you. You, you know, we do it to little children because it's so cute with them, but as adults, like, it's not cute. And that face that comes when you're just, when you've tasted something sour, that's the face of the bitterly jealous person. They're just always walking around like something they just ate is terrible. They're making sounds like, oh, oh, can you believe her? Can you believe him? I don't understand what, sh- can you believe that? They're so envious of someone else's accomplishments or possessions that they they just can't help but let everybody know about that fault and really about how God feels about it. Like, can you believe that that she bought that car? Do you know how many children could have been fed in starving countries if they would have just taken if she would have taken that money instead of buying the car, giving it to charity? And oh, we better pray for her. We better right. There's that appearance of like, oh, I really care, but no. In reality, it's just I I hate her. She's always got more money than me, or she's always doing this. And it has very little to do about God. It has more to do with her own issues. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. Now, you can see that these are kind of the the underlying roots of what starts to come out. So there's bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. Selfish ambition, right? This is very simple. Someone who's selfish, and their selfishness does something very specific. It creates factions. It draws in a group of people. It's like, hey, this church is crazy. Like, let me tell you about what really is going on behind the scenes. And, you know, I'm really the only one who understands truth, and you, you need to follow me, and then we're going we're gonna to lead the rebellion to overthrow Brian and the rest of the pastors, and we're going to take on, we're going to take over Riverside. This person gathers people towards their cause. There's an ambition, but it's a selfish ambition. It has nothing to do with the Lord. It gives the appearance of wisdom. It gives the appearance of standing for truth, but it's not. It's all about self. Boasting. Boasting is just another word. Like, this is what starts to come out, right? So, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, and then from that, it starts to come out. At the expense of another person, I am going to highlight my characteristics and, 
and diminished another person. Now listen, guys, as we're sitting here and you start looking at these, please, you know, don't be elbowing the person next to you being like, that's you, that's you, you need to knock it off. Where are you at, buddy? Where, why are you not like this? Listen, just elbow yourself in the ribs because let's face it, we all struggle with these things throughout time and this is not meant to, you know, this is not a time for us to point fingers but to really think about our own lives. Like, boasting is is bragging about yourself at the expense of someone else. It is a fruit of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And then, of course, that leads to false, false to the truth. It leads to lying. Lying is a fruit of that, right? It is something that comes out. It is not only just a complete opposite of the truth because, no, 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 lying is much more subversive than just a complete falsehood. No, lying usually comes in the form of what? Like true, truth-ish, it's like truth light. It's exaggeration. It's taking things that are kind of true and just adding the slightest little change. And, I, you know, we could give examples about all of this over and over. We, it's just not a lot of time to do that. But you understand, are you someone who exaggerates a lot? Are you someone that takes pieces of truth and just adds a little bit of doubt and questioning into that in order to bring about something that benefits you? This happens with children all day. My children. Did you hit her? Did you hit him? One of the kids comes in, ah, he hit me. Did you hit him? No. (laughs) I smacked him. (laughs) Yeah. Let me show you the difference, son. (laughs) There is no difference. Um... Yeah, just the other day, like, I, my daughter had a thing she was playing. It was clearly mine. I'm like, did you take that? F- is, that is that mine? I don't know. <sighs> Where'd you get it? Your nightstand drawer. <laughs> then it's mine. <laughs> you know it's mine. False to the truth. And then we just see it, it's earthly. It's unspiritual. It's demonic. It's just not, it has no interest in what God wants. It is earthly. It is of this earth. It's just opposed to what's godly and heavenly. It is unspiritual. There's no thought about God and what he wants. It is then just, you know, he just throws out the, the final word. He's like, look, all of this, it's just demonic, right? It's just the opposite of angelly. It is demonly. It is against what God wants. That is false wisdom. So what is the common theme that you see throughout all of that? It all revolves around what? Self. It all revolves around what you want and how it will benefit you and how you will grow. And so we do this. We, we, we are, again, we're processing information. We're making decisions. And those decisions can veer one way or the other, and we start going through, and maybe we're feeling these things, and we are making decisions that benefit the self. There's no interest in God or the gospel, the cross, the things that are so precious to us. If you want to be able to false or spot false wisdom, we have to look for thinking and speaking and actions that have to do with what what one person wants. And often, God's name will get thrown into the mix to show that maybe God is supportive or that he's involved. Faith is unrecognizable in there. And I think if we thought hard, it's not hard to think about kind of false wisdoms that are out there, just things that appear to be wise and very, oh yeah, that's good, you know, but it's empty, just statements like, follow your heart. Yeah, I know. My heart is so right all the time. I'm just going to follow it, follow it over a cliff. <laughs> Do what makes you happy. God just wants you to be happy. Listen, I don't want to, I don't want this to be a big downer today, but just in case you didn't know, <laughs> it's not God's ultimate purpose in your life or my life is for, to make us happy. There's a deeper thing. There are deeper things going on, and we're going to talk about that when we look at true wisdom. But we see this, and look, as you're getting ready to graduate high school for my seniors out there, or you're getting ready to get married, people, or you're getting ready to have kids, or you're getting ready to just enter into all new seasons of life, these are the things that are going to be tempting us to to go one way or the other. Say, will I follow God, or will I follow what 
I want to do, and we have to constantly be on guard for that. Then there's true wisdom. So we got all this, one through seven, right? And I, there it is. (laughs) True wisdom. Let's just put them side by side. Look at this list. And he even goes on so far as to say, wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. It's like he's giving us, like, here, here's a little bit of an order to help you. Pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, impartial, sincere. Guys, these are, this is what we want. This is what we need. And these are not easy. Pure, it's just the opposite of unjust. It's, it's following God with unmixed motives. I'm just going to follow God. It's just nothing to do with me. I'm just going to do what he, he wants me to do. It's pure. There's a purity about wisdom, godly wisdom. It's peaceable. Oh, man, help us, Lord. This means you are a peacemaker. Yeah, I got silent. It just sinks in like, yeah, peacemaker. Oh, man. This is someone who's harmonious, who, who creates harmony. Do you know what harmony is? Harmony is a, is a complementary movement with someone else, right? We just had awesome worship time, and when, what happens is one person sings here, the other person sings here, not because it's just where they want to sing, but because it actually sounds beautiful when they sing here, and as this person moves, they move together, and it's glorious. It sounds wonderful. Like, that's our life. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're to be living in step with one another. That's how, that's how we know that this isn't just about, okay, my life with God. It's about us living life together. It is peaceable. And he says it again down in verse 18, right? He says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Whew, man, we need to understand this. That Like, we need to be peacemakers. These are, again, like kind of the, the foundational elements here. There's, pe- there's purity, there's peace, and then what flows from that? Oh, man, there's a gentleness. There's gentle. And like all the women in here are going, man, I just wish guys would be more gentle. And guys are going, I don't want to be gentle. But yet it's, it's this foundational characteristic. Like this, is, this bubbles up from a pure and peaceable foundation. There's gentleness. Gentle, do you, I want you to hear this. When we talk about gentle, we talk about you are not combative even when you're provoked. Not defensive. How many people are defensive in here? Yeah, yeah there's like <laughs> just a half of, yeah. Yeah, defensive, man, we, some of us are more than others, but yeah, like we just, we want to defend to the end, like I'm right and you need to know, and so we just, we're talking about being gentle when someone comes at us and like, no, no, you, you, we're like, okay, you're provoking me, it doesn't mean that I'm backing down and into some cave and like, okay, I don't have any conviction, I don't know anything, no, 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 that's not it at all, we have our convictions, but we are gentle in the process of applying it, right, because that's the next part too, it's reasonable, it means open to reason. This is a person who listens. A person who listens to others instead of attacking. So these go hand in hand. It doesn't mean you're convictionless, but you're skillfully applying your conviction to the situation. Let me just say, being right isn't everything. You want a wisdom bomb? Being right isn't everything, right? When you're you're engaged in like road life and you're a pedestrian and you're a driver, who has the right of way? The pedestrian has the right of way. So you could, this would be an application of faith, you could be ready to cross the street and say, I don't care what's going on around, I have the right of way, I'm walking across the street. And there are many cars who would agree, maybe you're even right, but in the end, being right isn't everything. (laughs) Sometimes being right isn't a victory. And again, this is not about not having, not taking a stand. It's about, oh, like listening and thinking deeply as we're in a world where there's just a lot of new things constantly hitting us. There's always information flowing in, and we are 
we're just, I know a lot of us, our heads are just spinning, and you know what, and we just are so quick to be, we see something on Facebook, and we're just like, no, uh, mean, hate you, uh. and it's just like, I just sit back and watch sometimes, I'm going, well, that, that didn't help, you think you changed their mind? No, they're probably dug in even deeper now. We start to see some of the fruit here, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, like good fruit, like full of mercy. Like, are you full of mercy? Do you want to be full of mercy? It's like I'm just extending outward to other people mercy. I'm doing merciful things for others, right? You, it, it all flows from this, right? If, if there's purity, peaceable, gentleness, reasonableness, it's like, yes, I want to be merciful to everyone around, and I will care for those in need. And then impartial, sincere. Do you know what sincere is? It is genuineness. Like, can people just take you at your word? And to just believe that what you're saying is not when you go, when you turn around, there's not that, like, oh, can you believe what that conversation was like? You're not going to guess what she said. And there's no hypocrisy. It's just like, yeah, I can... I can believe that you are a sincere person. This is false wisdom. This is true wisdom. This is where we, <laughs> we find ourselves in the middle of, right? So what's, what's, the, what's the common thread to the false wisdom? Self. What's the common thread to true wisdom? God. He is at the center of all of this because without him, we are none of that. We are none of that. We are all of this, and we are none of that. That, and look, this requires faith because I'm going to tell you what, no one thinks acting like this is going to get them what they want. And that's where the rub comes because we want what we want. And we're like, oh, but if I'm peaceable and gentle and reasonable, people are just going to walk all over me and I'll never have my way. And so we're like, no, I need to be boom, 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 boom. And what happens? We see the, the results. The, the fruit is there. The results, he tells us, for false disorder, what is it? Or false wisdom? It's disorder and every vile practice. Like, great, you want to be in the false wisdom camp? Be ready for a disorderly life with vileness. But true wisdom, what's the result? A harvest of righteousness. There's like fruit of great things. Beautifully smelling, beautifully tasting fruit. James tells us early on here, he says, when he says, who's wise? He says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It's such a gospel word. And I t we talked about gentleness, like meekness is similar. Meekness is the characteristic of the, of the wise person, of the godly person. Do you know what meekness is? It is humility. It is <clears throat> a posture of not being overly impressed by yourself. The wise person, if we were to ask the question, who's wise and understanding among you? Okay, the people who just immediately raise their hand, be like, me. Eh, maybe. <laughs> maybe not. That's God calls us to meekness. C.S. Lewis has this great quote, and I, I've said it so many times over the years. He just says, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That is something we need to remember and think on. So let me just end here with uh, a few thoughts, just application. How do we grow in this? <clears throat> Three things that I want to point your attention to. Know God and learn what he loves. Know people and live in community and surrender and get uncomfortable. I'm just going to quickly go through these. The band can come on up. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So look, we, you want to grow in this. You want to be in the, the true wisdom camp. Well, first of all, it just takes a deep understanding of, of knowing God and understanding who He is. And the way that we do that is we first trust Him for the forgiveness of our sins. We understand that, that Jesus Christ was sent to the earth to, to die for sinners, 
to live a life that we were supposed to live, that we couldn't live, and to die the, the death of judgment under, under God's law and God's wrath that we were supposed to die, but, but he took that for us, and so we, we go to him and we understand that we are, we are at the foot of the cross all on the same playing field, saying that we are sinners in need of saving. And so we know God, we learn more about him. We don't just go through the list and say, okay, today I'm going to be more pure, peaceable. No, we, we go to God and we say, God, would you please help me? Would you please help me to do this? I want to understand you more. And so we trust in Christ. We read our, the scriptures. We soak in God's word. We come to church. We, we, we hear God's word being taught. This is why we preach the Bible here. We don't just preach what I want to say or do. We preach what God's word says so that we may grow and get stronger in God's word because that is what's going to produce the good things here and then we have to trust that he's going he's gonna to work in that. And it takes faith. And we pray to grow in these things. And then we apply. We try to apply these things. Look, let me just give you a way to apply this. We can go through this list, the, the, the true wisdom list, or both lists, really, and let it be a guide in decision making. Before you make your next purchase, you think about these things. Before you, before you make that post and you hit that send button, you think, okay, is this peaceable? Is this reasonable? Have I gone through this process to say, like, God is really glorified in what I'm about to do? To my younger friends, as you think about what you give your life to and your time to, Maybe you're in high school, middle school, college, early 20s, you're figuring things out like this. Hearing these things is going to save you from potential severe consequences to think and pray and trust God to, to live that pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable life. To my older friends, again, just because you're getting older doesn't mean that, that you, you're automatically wiser. You have to fight for this as well, and maybe even more so because there's more things kind of ingrained in there. And because you're role models to those who are, who are looking to you. Your examples to others. Are you open to reason? Are you listening to what the younger generation is saying? Or are you just saying, ah, quiet. <laughs> when you get older, you'll understand. Like, we got to stop that. We have to listen. We have to hear. Don't be so set in your ways that it's always just about you convincing others about your point and position. Guys, when we, when we talk to one another, don't just wait until the words have finished coming out of their mouth before you jump onto what you're getting ready to say. Listen, listen, and hear what... This is understanding the mind of God, man. He tells us to be quick to hear and slow to speak, and so we need that. We need to know God in order to live like this. We need to know people. It's the second thing. We need to know people and to live in community. It's just real quick. We just, we need other people in our lives. We, we have blind spots. They're called blind spots for reasons because we can't see them, and so we need other people to see them. And if you are constantly against other people seeing your blind spots, you need to stop. You need to turn that corner and invite others in. And finally, just to surrender and get uncomfortable. We, we just have to surrender our lives to these things and say, God, would you help? We have to give our lives away in serving. We want to serve. We want to serve other people. We want to serve the church. We need to get our eyes off of ourselves. Once we get our eyes off of ourselves, it really helps to open up to the world around us. We need to find comfort in being uncomfortable. I talk about that a lot and loudly. Like There's just a, there's something important because we grow when we're uncomfortable. So we need to embrace the discomfort of just letting other people in, of listening, of absorbing. Look, you want to live the peaceable, pure, gentle life, you are going to have to absorb a lot because it's not the, well, I'm going to give it right back to you. It's like, all right, I'm going to hear, I'm going to listen, I'm going to be a peacemaker, I'm going to, I'm going to flow in this. It means you're going to have to take those shots. You're going to have to hear and, and, and handle that. And that's not easy. But we see Christ on the cross. We see Christ in his final days. His whole life was given to this, this meekness where he absorbed the wrath of God for us without fighting back, without arguing. Yet he had plenty of conviction. He, he, 
he accomplished his mission without aggressively coming after in the ways that we, we want to in order to prove our point. So this takes faith. This is where faith and wisdom intersect. So I'm going to pray for us that God would help here. Lord, we, we need you. I just know that we are often just full of self. And God, that there is hope for us because of the cross. There is hope for us because of Christ. There is hope because if anyone is like me, they see themselves in the left-hand list. Bitterly jealous, selfishly ambitious, unspiritual, earthly. God, thank you that there's hope that we can come and say, Lord, just help me to be pure. Help me to be peaceful. Help me to listen more. Help me to be gentle, to be impartial, sincere. God, this is who you are and you can strengthen me. You will strengthen me to live like that. And we can pray, God, give us faith to believe you for that. Give us faith to see you in it, Lord. To trust what you say. And even though we are weak, you are strong. Help us, God. Church, can we stand?